Good morning. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Despite a potential meeting with President Biden, the White House says Russian President Vladimir Putin is still planning to invade Ukraine. We have the latest on the crisis and new information on what could happen after an invasion. Also, ABC News has learned that President Biden's Supreme Court nomination could come as soon as this week. Biden's team spent the last few weeks reaching out to senators on both sides of the aisle. So far, we know the president is considering at least three candidates, including Judge Kentanji Brown-Jackson, Judge Leandra Kruger, and Judge J. Michelle Childs. The former Miami Dolphins head coach, who is suing the NFL for racial discrimination, has landed a new job. Brian Flores is now a senior defensive assistant and linebackers coach for the Pittsburgh Steelers. In a recent lawsuit, Flores is challenging the NFL's hiring practices, comparing the league to a plantation. And Beijing has officially wrapped up the Winter Olympic Games. Closing ceremonies on Sunday ended with the message, one world, one family. Here's the final medal count. Team USA racked up 25 medals, eight of them gold. Meanwhile, Norway is taking the top spot, winning 37 medals in total. And Russia appears to be on the brink of invading Ukraine. As we mentioned, the Kremlin said today that Russian forces destroyed two Ukrainian armored vehicles and killed five Ukrainians caught entering Russia. It's a worrying announcement as President Putin holds a very public meeting with his national security advisors on whether to recognize separatists in Ukraine as an independent group. Meanwhile, President Biden has agreed to a potential summit with Vladimir Putin in the hopes of finding a diplomatic resolution, but the White House insists Russia is still preparing to invade. ABC News senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me from Ukraine along with defense analyst Mick Mulroy. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Aaron, I want to start with you because one of our reporters who's there in the region called this meeting between Putin and his national security advisors quote, utterly surreal. So what do you think it means for Putin to even propose recognizing these Russian-controlled separatist regions in Ukraine as independent? It would certainly be an inflammatory step, Diane, because it would effectively end the efforts for diplomacy. And there really are two things happening simultaneously. On the one hand, you have the, the Russian foreign minister saying that President Putin would be willing to at least think about a summit with President Biden. That's contingent on there not being any kind of an invasion. On the other hand, you had this rather extraordinary meeting of Russia's National Security Council where President Putin went around the room and asked people for their opinion of whether Russia should recognize these breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine as, uh, as independent. And, and if he does that, that would give him the pretext that he needs to then send military force in under the guise of protecting the Russian speakers in those regions. Mick, what do you think Vladimir Putin's trying to do here? So, Diane, I think this is part of the playbook. Essentially, this is just theater. Uh, they are intending to do this. They are intending to invade. We've seen the forces come out of the assembly areas and starting to get into attack positions. We've seen the activities in what we would call phase zero or preparation phase with cyber attacks and these really what I would call amateurish false flag operations and videos that have been deemed fraudulent almost immediately after disclosure. Uh, this just seems to be one more part of their plan uh, to prepare and then eventually invade Ukraine. And, and Aaron, Ukraine has denied those reports that two Ukrainian armored vehicles and that five Ukrainians entered Russia and were destroyed. We have seen, as, Mitch men as Mick mentioned, a barrage of false reports, staged videos by Russia already. So how credible is this announcement by Russia at this point? Well, you have to take it with a, a rather large grain of salt, I think, because the U.S. and its Western allies believe this is simply Russia raising the prospect of a Ukrainian invasion to give them an excuse, again, to send in their own military troops, which have been massed rather menacingly along Ukraine's borders. Uh, the Ukrainians have used a, a, a recent term of art, calling it fake news, that their, that their own uh, uh, people are launching attacks into Russia-controlled areas or into Russian soil itself, despite these videos and, and the like, which have only been ramping up in recent days. And I think it's part of the reason why we've seen the U.S. call it out at every turn. Secretary of State Blinken anticipated just this, false flags followed by uh, meetings of Russian officials to give uh, kind of a rubber stamp to whatever Vladimir Putin ultimately decides.
And Aaron, a letter obtained by ABC News that was sent to the United Nations says the U.S. has, quote, credible information that indicates Russian forces are creating lists of identified Ukrainians to be killed or sent to camps following a military occupation. And that report includes journalists, anti-corruption activists, even minorities on a list of potential targets. So what do we know about that at this point? Well, this letter to the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights suggests that Russia will not be content simply with, with sending some troops across and, and staying in eastern Ukraine, but rather, and, and the U.S. has talked about this, coming in to, to make regime change in Kyiv, in the capital. And that would include, then, this list that the U.S. believes Russia is drawing up of, of journalists, of dissidents, and, and others to really cleanse the capital, especially uh, of people who might be anti-Russian or, or some kind of anti-Russian ideologues. And, and that would then allow them to decapitate the government, install perhaps a puppet government, the theory goes. We're a little ways off from this, but the U.S. believes that, that uh, Russia really has some intent to cause significant human suffering if it moves forward with this invasion. And Mick, what do these developments from just today alone do for both the chances of, of diplomatic efforts working and, and how does it change a potential military response by the U.S.? Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Aaron's exactly right. What, uh, the, the, the role that the Special Operations Forces will play in this conventional conflict will be just that. They will likely go after command and control, leadership, targets. They will then start a whole propaganda uh, element installing their own individuals. It's right out of what they call the Gerasimov doctrine, which is how Russia wages uh, war. So I think that's entirely right. And I think the Spetsnaz will probably be leading uh, that effort. As far as diplomacy, I think, uh, and, and I think Secretary Blinken has made it clear, we are absolutely willing to continue diplomacy. Uh, they will agree to meet this Thursday uh, only if uh, Russia doesn't invade. And it does appear that Russia may be using all of these diplomatic efforts as simply a ruse to prepare for this invasion. Only time will tell. I hope that's not the case, but that's what it's looking at like right now. All right, Aaron and Mick, we appreciate the analysis from both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Meanwhile, back here at home, President Biden met with his national security team this morning on what's shaping up to be a decisive day in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis. ABC News White House correspondent Mary Alice Parks joins us now with more on that. Mary Alice, what do we know so far about this meeting? Yeah, Diane, we saw the vice president as long, alongside the secretary of defense, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the CIA director and secretary of state Blinken all enter the White House this morning. The White House confirming, like you said, that the president is meeting with senior members of his national security team. And of course, this comes after yesterday, the president sat for over two hours with his national security council as well. And Mary Alice, the president, President Biden had agreed to a meeting with Putin on the condition that Russia does not invade the Ukraine. Now, given all of today's developments so far, how likely is that meeting now between Biden and Putin? Yeah, Diane, I have to tell you that White House sources are pretty skeptical that any meeting will happen. They said they, they, he agreed in principle because they don't want to close any diplomatic doors. But the White House continues to tell us that the overwhelming evidence is that Putin <laughs> plans to invade, that that continues to be their assessment, that nothing has changed that, nothing they're seeing on the ground has changed that assessment. And so no summit is going to be even planned, let alone take place, of course, if Putin does uh, march his troops across the border. All right, Mary Alice Parks at the White House for us. Thanks, Mary Alice. And England's Queen Elizabeth is said to be experiencing minor symptoms after testing positive for COVID-19. The 95-year-old tested positive for the virus after Prince Charles and Camilla were diagnosed. Lama Hassan is at Windsor Castle with the latest on the Queen's condition. The UK waking up to the news that Her Majesty has coronavirus. Buckingham Palace issuing a statement saying the 95-year-old has mild cold-like symptoms but expects to continue light duties at Windsor over the coming week. I think the fact that they've said that she's going to be carrying out light duties, suggesting that she's carrying on working, it's trying to give that impression that it's not too serious and to avoid any sort of sense of panic or alarm around the Queen's health. It has been widely reported that the Queen is vaccinated and boosted. But concerns for her health started over a week ago after her son Prince Charles and his wife Camilla both tested positive for the virus. 
with the palace confirming only that Charles had seen his mother recently. After the Queen had met Charles, the Queen had tested negative, so there wasn't any suggestion that she'd got it from him. There's been a mini outbreak of COVID at Windsor Castle, where she's mainly based these days, and I suggest it's probably from that. Her Majesty was last seen on Wednesday, carrying out an engagement in person, leaning on a walking stick. The Queen quipping she wasn't able to move. How are you? Well, as you can see, I can't move. So I think I might just put a knife in I it. think that's a really good idea. As she prepares to celebrate her platinum jubilee, messages of well wishes pouring in for Her Majesty. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson tweeting, I'm sure I speak for everyone in wishing Her Majesty the Queen a swift recovery from COVID and a rapid return to vibrant good health. Now, as for news on the Queen's health today, while the palace says they will not be providing a running commentary or updates on a daily basis unless there is something to say. So I guess no news is good news. Diane? All right, we'll take the good news for now, Lama Hassan at Windsor Castle. Thanks, Lama. And for more on this, I want to bring in physician at Stanford Children's Health, Dr. Alok Patel, for a little bit more. Dr. Patel, thanks for being here. What could a positive COVID diagnosis mean for a fully vaccinated 95-year-old at this point in the pandemic, or what does it offer? Mean. Now, Diane, a positive test is going to just tell us that there's SARS CoV 2 in somebody's nose. Positive COVID 19 means that there's some symptomatic illness. Now, the important thing that we have to understand is that according to public reports, Queen Elizabeth does have a vac vaccination in the past. We don't have the confirmation that she's fully boosted, but this population is still at increased risk, although less so than previously when they weren't vaccinated. So that is good news. And it's also great news that we presumably can say that she has access to great medical care and that absolutely matters. But if you look at CDC data, for COVID associated hospitalizations, the largest age group that we're still seeing being hospitalized are those people above the age of 65, at least in the United States. So it's still, is prudent that we pay a lot of attention to this highly vulnerable population. And so far we are hearing that her symptoms are mild, but what would you expect the Queen's doctors are monitoring and looking out for right now? You know, I don't wanna offer speculation about specifically Queen Elizabeth's case, because if we were to generally look at any patient out there, we wanna look at age, vaccination status, underlying medical conditions, which could absolutely kind of determine somebody's risk factor. So this is what I presume the doctors in England are looking at as would be the case with any patient. Now, again, I mentioned that we don't know anything about her specific medical history, but I would also suspect that in any patient, we can look at certain medications for non-hospitalized COVID patients that may help, such as things like Paxlovid, which is an antiviral, or Sotrovimab, which is the monoclonal antibody, which both show an effect against Omicron. So I suspect this is part of the arsenal and the history and kind of the tools that they're looking at to take the best care of Queen Elizabeth, who looks like she still has great energy, by the way, according to those clips. Yeah, she's still working, still carrying on her royal duties from the palace, or from the castle, I should say. Uh, and also in other COVID news, uh, what about this new Omicron subvariant. Could that affect the lower case and hospitalization numbers that we've been seeing in the US? You know, Diane, with this subvariant, the real world data is kind of confusing because right now if we so this is the Omicron BA2. Only about 4% of cases in the United States are actually seen are actually being sequenced as BA2. And across the world, we've seen several countries where it's gained a stronghold. And in some countries, such as the UK and South Africa, where the subvariant is actually becoming a dominant strain. Hospitalizations and cases are going down, but this is the opposite in places like Denmark. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, the study that's causing alarm bells is this lab study out of Japan. It's important to say that this is preprint, meaning it's not yet peer reviewed, but in a, lab, in a lab setting with animal models using hamsters and mice, they did found that, hey, it's possible that it could cause more severe disease, could be highly contagious, and may even be able to escape some of the antibodies and treatments we have, such as sotrovimab, which we just talked about. So I think the important thing here is that we maintain the surveillance. We're looking out for new variants. And people realize that even when we transition to an endemic phase, everything could completely change, such as this fall, which is why we still can't say, like, hey, we're out of coronavirus altogether. Now, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that U.S. regulators are looking at a potential authorization for a fourth dose of a COVID vaccine in the fall. So what else do we know about that? And why the fall as opposed to the spring, which would be six months after some people got their last booster shot? 
Well, I think the big three questions we have to ask right now, at least domestically, is regarding a fourth shot, who would actually get this shot? What type of shot would it be? Would it be general? Would it be an Omicron-specific one? And when would people get it, which is what you were alluding to? Now, right now, we've seen that Israel, Sweden, some other countries are already moving forward with plans for the fourth shot. But as of right now, it looks like cases are going down, hospitalizations are going down, and the original three-dose recommendation, or two if you got J&J, &J, is still providing excellent coverage against severe hospitalizations and deaths. But Diane, I think what you were mentioning was that study showing that after about two months, the protection does wane. But you have to take that into account with the data we have right now. It's what's happening, which is why in fall, things may change. That may be a different time period, especially as we get back into a colder season. And we'll have even more data by then, which is why I think it's a more prudent time for us to say, let's collect more data. Let's see if this can be bashed with a flu shot. And let's see what actually happens with real world data with the booster when we're not just looking at antibody levels, but we're looking at the complete picture. Is there any concern about being over vaccinated? Is that a th is that a thing? Could that be a thing down the line? Is there any way this backfires? You know, I think anything could backfire if we're going against public guidelines because we won't have a great way to kind of follow that data. And I will tell you, between you and I and the millions of people who might be watching right now, I know several people who have gone against recommendations and gotten multiple vaccines by going to several pharmacies, people out wow. there who have a heightened concern. And I would recommend against that unless you are directly talking to a health provider and if you're immunocompromised and you have increased concerns, talk to someone. Don't just go out there and get multiple shots by gaming the different pharmaceutical systems. That is not the way we want to do things. All right, great advice. Dr. Alok Patel, always great to talk to you. Thank you. Coming up, voting is underway in Texas, where some say new laws are making it tougher for people to cast their ballots. When we come back, we meet the 74-year-old woman who made sure her vote counted. Welcome back. We're marking Black History Month and President's Day with early voting underway in Texas. But there are growing concerns about new laws there that many say make it harder for certain people to cast their votes. Our congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has more on the changes and the impact. Texas voters heading to the polls for the nation's first primary. Get out and vote. The state's new and strict election law is being put to the test. What was the first thing that crossed your mind when you learned of the new election laws in the state of Texas. Jim Crow 2.0. 74-year-old Pam Gaskin has been voting by mail for nearly a decade. She says it has never been this hard to cast her ballot. Have you ever experienced anything like this before? No, no. You don't know which way to turn. Pam and her husband Michael, who suffers from Parkinson's disease, were denied ballots twice. And they are among thousands of voters who have had mail-in ballot applications rejected in Texas. One reason, for the first time, voters are required to submit their social security number or driver's license number. And it has to be the same form of ID they used when they first registered to vote. For Pam, that was 46 years ago. I'm 74 years old. I certainly didn't remember what I put on my application. It took three forms, 28 days, several calls, and some guessing before her mail-in ballot was accepted. These laws were meant to stop certain classes and categories of people from voting. Across the country, 19 states have passed laws that make it tougher for people to vote. Civil rights organizations are sounding the alarm. So we've seen really extraordinary results coming from the power of the black community in Texas. And, and unfortunately, it is exactly because of that power that we've seen state officials react by trying to make voting more difficult for that community. Republicans in Texas insist the new law protects the integrity of elections. Some voters support the changes. In your opinion, these new changes, you see them as helping protect elections. Yes, I do. Oh, yeah. I don't want any fraud. But Pam worries others won't go through the lengths she did to cast their ballot. I want everybody who can hear me say this, to, to hear this, it is worth it. It is worth it. Don't give up. Don't give in. So, Diane, some civil rights organizations are calling this a test run for that new election law, but they say what's even more concerning is that some states are actually looking to copy it ahead of the midterm elections. Diane? All right, Rachel Scott, thank you. Coming up, how one 11-year-old is spreading kindness and paying it forward to those in need. Stay with us.
Welcome back for a look at the day's science and technology headlines. Here's Mona Kozar Abdi. In today's Tech Bites, big tech sales for President's Day. Dell is discounting dozens of laptop models up to $400 off. Samsung also offering big savings on home entertainment. You can save up to $3,000 on select televisions and sound bars. Former President Trump has just launched his new social media app a year after he was booted from Twitter, Facebook, and other major platforms. With the President's Day rollout, Truth Social is now available in the Apple App Store. It's not clear when the Android version is coming out. And a lucrative day for Ye. The artist formerly known as Kanye West revealed that Donda 2 will only be available through his $200 stem player. Ye posted to Instagram that as of Saturday, he made more than $2.2 million in 24 hours, adding God is good. Those are your Tech Bites. Diane, back to you. All right, Mona Kozar Abdi, thank you. And today we're introducing you to a remarkable 11-year-old. He was recently named Kid of the Year, all because of his kindness and determination to pay it forward. ABC News Live Pride anchor Lindsay Davis has his story. Orion Jean considers himself an ambassador for kindness. For me, it can take on so many different forms from just smiling at somebody or holding the door. At just 11 years old, Orion is wise beyond his years. It all started two years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, when he won the National Kindness Speech Contest. Kindness is more important now than ever before. At the time that I wrote this speech, the world seemed like it had shut down, and hope was, like it was like, where, where is it? Where is the hope? Where is the love? Orion, a living, breathing call to action, took the $500 prize money and paid it forward, creating Race to Kindness. I decided to start my own kindness initiative. His first kindness project, Race to 500 Toys, was a toy drive to benefit patients at a local children's hospital. He then moved on to a food drive, delivering 100,000 meals to families in need. He then turned to books, collecting and delivering 500,000 books to kids at book fairs across the country. This sixth grader, such an inspiration, Time Magazine named him Kid of the Year. It's amazing to just think about how much of an impact it's going to make on the person who receives the kindness and hopefully they'll want to spread kindness and it's a ripple effect that goes on. Lindsay Davis, ABC News, New York. All right, Lindsay, thank you. And I'm Diane Macedo. Stay with ABC News Live for all the day's events and breaking news. We have more top stories for you right after this break. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.